I just want to say um, we could really use all the light that we can get. So I want to thank this lovely couple, and I want to thank all of you for being here. You know, Shabbat, sometimes you come, you go through the motions, and sometimes it feels extra special, almost like a little miracle. So in our Sidurim, speaking of miracles, if you go to the bottom of page 198, and you can go or you can just trust me, <laughs> we are reminded of the purpose of reciting Nisim B'chol Yom, of our daily miracles. They are supposed to evoke in us wonder and amazement at the things that we take for granted very often. So we wake up, we open our eyes, we clothe our bodies, and we are free. So we recite, Baruch Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Matir Asurim. Praise to you, Adonai, our God, sovereign of the universe, who frees the captive. What happens, though, how might this prayer change when not all human beings are free, and not even all Jews are free? This is a question to which our sages have devo devoted great debate, machloket, as we call it. So tonight, we're going to explore the ins and outs of wondering how far do we go to save a human life? What do we do when somebody is held captive? And we're going to look at that in its Talmudic context, but also in what's going on in life today. So I want to pose this non-rhetorical question. What do you think, or what does Torah tell us, is one of the most important mitzvot in the Jewish tradition? And there's no right or wrong. Just whatever. You could shout it out. We have no microphone. Celebrating a wedding. That's one of them. Honoring your parents. Pursuing justice. Or did I miss it? You got it. Okay. Saving a life. So they're all great, but that's what I'm looking for right there. <laughs> So we can take a moment to say how beautiful this PowerPoint is. I worked really hard on that cover. <laughs> and we can move on to our next slide. During the 12th century, Rabbi Moshe ben Maimon, also known as Rambam or Maimonides, compiled a work called the Mishnah Torah. And this is one of Jewish tradition's first legal codes. This excerpt on our screen here is from Sefer Zra'im, literally the Book of Seeds, this is the seventh book in the Mishnah Torah. It talks about agricultural laws. But this chapter most specifically talks about the laws of obligatory gifts to the poor. So we read here, Ve'ein lecha mitzvah gedola kepidion shvuim. Indeed, there is no greater mitzvah than the redemption of captives. Shashavui harehu bichlal har har evim ve'atzmeim ve'arumim ve'omed v'sakanat nefashot. For a captive is among those who are hungry, thirsty, naked, and their lives are in danger. So this goes beyond just saving a life. It's feeding the poor, feeding the needy, right? Giving people who might be in need of resources. It is a large category. So Maimonides here summarizes what is taught in the Talmud, that redeeming the ca captives is one, if not the greatest mitzvah, because captives are thought to be in every category of vulnerability. We have seen this to be true with the accounts of hostages released over the past week from Gaza. Of course, we are grateful for the hostages to be coming home. But there is this continued torment felt by former hostages and their families, and I would wager all of us watching. Many are returning home, and not just Israelis, but many are returning home to an impartial family. So they're leaving people behind in Gaza, mending the family, but not necessarily making it whole or complete. And in addition to that, we're hearing like the New York Times said, which, you know, the New York Times is not always in support of Israel, but even the New York Times recognized the plight of the hostages. We are hearing the horrors of what they went through 
emotionally, physically, and psychologically. Some were confined in tight spaces and tunnels. Children were forcibly recorded on camera. Some were coerced to watch scarring footage from October 7th. Many deprived of food, given just a piece of bread or some rice and cheese. Others home, coming home infested with lice, having not bathed for over 50 days. So if we questioned or doubted Maimonides' claim, wondering if captives truly are at higher risk, the stories from the hostages affirm what he argued to be true. In fact, the most recent halachic code, called the Shulchan Aruch, goes as far as saying that every moment one delays unnecessarily the ransoming of a captive, it is as if he were to shed blood. But according to Jewish tradition, that's not the whole story. It gets a little more complicated. There is more to the question of rescuing hostages that makes their redemption, believe it or not, probably to our heart's dismay, a debate. And one that is not a matter of right or wrong, as I was talking with Rabbi Blake earlier today, but a true ethical dilemma, a dilemma of multiple rights, as we might put it. So if we could go to slide two. Thank you. You hit it one more time? Perfect. So this next excerpt is from the Mishnah, from the Talmud, in tractate Gitin. Gitin is the plural for the word get. Get is the Jewish legal document that one must receive or get in order to have a divorce. So this tractate talks about divorces, among other things, including matters of tikkun olam. So here the Mishnah reads, the captives are not redeemed for more than their actual monetary value for the betterment of the world. Now, we live in a society where a price tag on a human being sounds outrageous, right? Asking ourselves, what is someone's monetary value? But let's assume we have the same monetary value, all of us, and we know one individual's value. If that were to be so, then I want to ask another question of all of you. What do you think the sages meant when they said for the betterment of the world? How could paying no less or no more for a hostage, in any way, scenario, better society. What do you think? Is that a whisper? It's a hard question, so, yeah. If you're freeing a terrorist, it's not for the betterment of the world. So, I don't think, it, does that fit into that category? Okay, so are all people the same? If you're freeing a terrorist, if someone has committed a crime, then what does it do to society to bring them back into society and maybe going beyond their monetary value is going too far? Michelle. Say more. What's the industry? Okay, so you can... Okay, so you can make profit off of people. Yeah. Steve? Uh, it would dis- it's intended to discourage taking hostages. I know, taking captives. So paying more than one's value. Would, would generate a reason to, t- to continue to take captives. Okay, so paying more for one's value might generate a reason to continue taking captives. Let's take one more, Fran. Not not related to eye for an eye, though you could probably make a connection there. Eye for an eye is relating if someone wrongs you, you can wrong them back in an equal-like manner. Yeah. Okay. So for those of you that are still thinking, I don't blame you. (laughs) You're very much like our sages who wrestled with these ideas. They debated them greatly. So we're going to look to our next slide to see some of the ideas they proposed. So the first one, we see two possibilities. The first one is that it is due to the financial pressure of the community. Is the concern that the increase in price will lead to the community assuming financial pressures it might not be able to manage? So that's kind of similar to what Michelle said about it being about making profits. So that's one side of the industry. The other side of the industry would be that the community couldn't financially sustain 
redeeming the captives because it would become too expensive. So moving to the second proposal, it is because the result of this will be that they will learn to take more people captive. And I think this is what we've seen and what people have been mentioning, that the more you pay for somebody, the more likely people are going to continue to take people captive, even worse, increase the amount of people they take captive because they know there will be a financial reward. And the sages' guesses foreshadowed a truth we've seen throughout Israel's history, the downside and dangers of redeeming a captive for, quote, more than their value. So I'll just name a few instances without boring everybody, but it's important to have that background. In 1976, there was a Palestinian-led hijacking of an international civilian passenger flight between Tel Aviv and Paris, known as the Entebbe Raid. The hijackers took the entire plane with 248 passengers hostage with the stated objective of compelling the release of 40 Palestinian militants imprisoned in Israel and the release of 13 prisoners from other countries. In 1985, there was the Jibril um, Agreement, a prisoner exchange between the Israeli government and the government of the Palestinians, where Israel released 1,150 prisoners for just three Israeli prisoners. I'm going to skip some of my other examples down to in 2006. We all know, likely, Israeli soldier... Gilad Shalit was captured and taken into Gaza. Controversially, the Israeli government exchanged Shalit for the release of 1,027 Palestinians, prisoners, what our sages would argue was certainly above one person's worth. And yet, we ask ourselves, isn't one life worth the entire world, right? We literally read in Talmud to save one life is tantamount to saving a whole world. But what do we do if saving one life puts other lives at risk? And this is what you were saying, right? To this day, people wonder if the Shalit deal was worth it. If releasing more than a thousand prisoners capable of doing more harm is justifiable for bringing one human being home. Imagine this, having to make this excruciating decision that no human being should have to make. As we can see, this debate, how far we go to save one human life, is a question that goes as deep as it can for the Jewish people, not just in the text, but in our lives as well. And yet again, Israel finds itself in this very debate. Since October 7th, Israeli citizens have been very concerned with the Israeli government. Are they prioritizing the war and winning the war? Or are they prioritizing bringing home the lives of hostages, people that they love? The government certainly has been navigating an unprecedented task with so many Israelis held captive. And I'm not referring here to, you know, on October 7th, there's a lot of feelings about Netanyahu and the Netanyahu government and the lack of security. I'm referring to after that, simply about the matter of now, what do we do with all these hostages versus the war? And this week, we've seen what they had in mind. For every hostage held in Gaza, the Israeli government has released at least three Palestinian prisoners. How is it, once again, we ask, that more people who have committed crimes, according to the Israeli government, are being released for a smaller number of who we think to be innocent lives. So I just want to show us the next slide just to bear witness to what's happening in Israel. This on the left is from, I would guess I would call it email of articles, email updates from author Daniel Gordis. It's called Israel from the Inside. And he authored the book Israel, A Concise History of a Nation Reborn. And so he gives updates to people over email, something like a subscription letter. And the title of what he wrote recently is, if Israel has to choose between the hostages and winning the war, and noting the ellipsis, because it is an open-ended question. 
And when we look to the right here, this picture, prisoner deal while they're still alive. You can feel in that poster the fear of we're running out of time. And I think people feel that running out of time both for the war and for the hostages. Does the government save all of the lives according to a crucial mandate for our people? That to redeem the captives is one of the greatest mitzvot? Or do they worry about protecting other Israeli lives against a future attack? Which could happen because when we have a ceasefire, Hamas has time to regroup, to gain more fighters, and possibly launch another attack. So I bring these texts tonight to demonstrate that what Israel is experiencing is living Talmud. Not matters from the dusty books on our shelves, but debates come alive, asking more of people than we could ever wish to confront. Planning to think about what to say tonight was incredibly difficult for me because my heart wants to have an answer. And to be honest, I lean with the people praying for their loved ones because I'm not a politician and I bet there's a lot that I don't know and I bet there's a lot that we don't know. So tonight I want to conclude with the word teku. Raise your hand if you've ever heard the word teku. Not clergy, don't count. <laughs> okay, so teku is a word from the Talmud that our sages use to suggest there's no perfect resolution. Can't even come up with one right now, and it'll have to let it stand. This question of human life is the function of machloket in our lives, and as we can see, it's not always comfortable or even desirable, but debating and asking and participating that is part of what it means to be Jewish, especially when lives are at stake. As Rabbi Blake said earlier, Jacob wrestles with the being, wrestles with himself, God, we're not really sure. But what we know is that when he comes out of it, his name is changed. He receives a blessing. It is considered a blessing to be somebody that wrestles. And he is our namesake. We are the people of Israel. Each of us is a stakeholder in this seemingly ancient conversation that we are realizing is not at all ancient. We are Israel because we wrestle with right and wrong, with how to proceed forward. And though I wish more than anything I had an answer, I wanted to end us tonight with the prayer that I began with. And I think back to the beautiful song that Cantor Rodnisky sang, Hatsi Leni Na, Save Me Please. Baruch Ata Adonai, Eloheinu Melech Olam, Matir Asurim. May our loved ones be saved swish, swiftly, such that all are finally free. And may we finally never have to be faced with this impossible task again. Shabbat Shalom. Amen.